Okay, we're recording now. So uh, thank you, everybody. My name is Chris Rivera, Superintendent of Lyons Elementary School District 103. I have some guests here, very knowledgeable in their field from uh, North Shore Clinical Labs, um, here to talk about a couple of topics, the one pertinent to us, well, both pertinent to us, but uh, we are looking to implement some COVID testing um, on a volunteer basis. And so they're going to describe a little bit about that and then some vaccination information as well. So I'm going to turn it over to to the experts. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Rivera. Uh, and thank you for arranging for this call. It's a pleasure to be here this, uh, this evening. Um, North Shore Clinical Labs, we're a Albany Park-based uh, high-complexity molecular lab. Uh, we have been uh, working in the COVID area uh, pretty much since the onset of the pandemic. Uh, and joining me on this call uh, today is uh, one of our medical directors, Dr. Asim Syed, who is also the chief medical officer of Insight Health, which is uh, formerly Mercy Hospital. So uh, Dr. Syed, I'm going to turn to you uh, to provide a discussion around the current state of um, public health. Uh, and some of the topics that uh, you feel would be pertinent uh, with regards to COVID, uh, the Delta variant, as well as uh, vaccine hesitancy, and what you're seeing as a clinician in the field. So um, thank you, doctor. Sure. Thank you so much. And thank you guys for uh, having me on this call. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, just by looking at the numbers and looking at the data and everything that's going on, um, the COVID numbers are starting to climb up, and it's something that's very serious and not to be taken lightly. Um, you know, essentially, you know, we were able to get through the first uh, the first phase. You know, get vaccinations out there. Um, we're you know by just frequently testing, isolating, um, and we we're really able to control it. But now, it's what what we're seeing is that this new Delta variant that's coming up. Uh, Delta is something that's more contagious than just your regular COVID. They're saying that it is uh, as contagious as the chicken pox. Um, what we're finding is that a lot of these numbers that are coming up, it's mainly happening in the population that has not been vaccinated. Um, if you look at the data right now, uh, majority of the severe disease uh, requiring uh, you know, hospitalization um, and majority of the deaths that are coming, that are surrounding uh uh, uh, these numbers right now are mainly coming from the unvaccinated population. Um, if you're vaccinated, that's not to say that you're completely out of the woods. Um, if you are vaccinated, we're sending, we're, we're seeing a trend where people can still get it and that they are, are having a lot more of a milder, uh, uh, version of, of, of the disease. Um, and so really it just points back to kind of like, you know, we really need to uh, uh, educate people on vaccination and the importance of vaccination. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions around vaccination about, you know, how long will this vaccine last for? What are the side effects like? Um, really, at the end of the day, uh, we've only had this vaccine out for more or less about six months. So we only have about six months of data. But what we do know is that it's been very effective. Um, if you think about it, um, something as simple as the flu shot, which we you know we get every single year, um, that really only has about a 60 to 70 percent efficacy rate. Um, whereas with the COVID vaccine, we're seeing efficacy up in the you know the 90 percent, 90 percent area. And so, just that alone is really going to help to you know control those numbers. And I think that we had a very good push, and that was what really uh, that with the combination of you know social distancing, uh, masks, things like that. Uh, we were really able to bring those numbers down. So I guess going forward now with, you know, with the Delta variant coming up, um, I think that, you know, the most important thing for us to do is to focus on, you know, getting vaccinated. And I understand that with the school aged children, um, they're a population which are technically not eligible for the vaccine. And that's really mainly based off of, you know, uh, weight based. Uh, based on, you know, a child's weight, uh, we have to be able to determine if they can be able to, you know, tolerate that vaccine or not. And so the risk that comes up now is that children, and you know, I have little children of my own, um, and so this is something that that's very, very concerning and close to me is that, you know, children can get can get the, get COVID. Um, there there are there have been some severe cases, but for the most part, a lot of them are getting a very mild form. But really, it's kind of like they they would be the carriers, 
And so through children, they can bring it back home. Uh, other family members, elder family members, the community, neighbors. I mean, that's how it just starts to spread back again. And so the mainstay is that one is that, you know, definitely we have to focus on social distancing. We have to focus on wearing a mask. We have to focus on educating people that, um, that you know, just you know, just kind of on the fence and really would just want, need more information and, and to learn about getting vaccinated, to encourage them to get vaccinated. And then third part is I, I would say frequent testing. The reason why I say frequent testing is mainly because if you look at, you know, countries like Korea and places like that, um, they were very aggressive in isolating out uh, COVID and reopening up their country. And really is because they had quick, easy access to, t- uh, to uh, uh, early testing and they were testing frequently. And they, of course, they used technology with Bluetooth, but they were able to really kind of do a good contact tracing and were able to isolate it out. And so I think uh, in, in this instance, at least with the schools, um, that this is something that would definitely be uh, um, a worthwhile measure. Really, if you think about it, like instead of being able to shut down an entire school, really, if we can just do and I, and I don't use the term contact tracing to point out, hey, who's patient zero, because it's not about that. It's more about, you know, safety for the community at large. Um, if we we're able to kind of, you know, determine who's had exposure um, to make sure they're in the clear so that way the schools can remain open, the children can remain uh, in school and the families can be safe. I think that would be a great approach to take. Uh, I think another point I wanted to touch on was uh, one of the concerns that, uh, you know, some community members feel that um, the vaccination uh, or even COVID testing could lead to, you know, uh, um, you know, identifying people or looking into their uh, uh, documentation or, or I guess their citizens, citizenship status. Uh, this is absolutely not about that at all. Um, this is more about community health and it's more focused on the health of the population. Um, that data is not even accounted for. Uh, if you look at, you know, really some of what the government regulations are, uh, it's not our purpose to look for identification but rather we have to show that we made an honest effort to ask for identification. And at that point, if we don't have identification, our job is to, you know, give that person the vaccine or give them the testing that they require because the goal is mainly, you know, public health. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, you know, kind of the, the brief summary of, 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 of my talking points, but if anyone has any questions, you know, please feel free to let me know. Yeah, no, no, thank you, doctor. I, I, I do appreciate that oversight. Um, I'm going to segue a little bit more into North Shore and some of the activities that that we do as well. Uh, So as I previously mentioned, uh, North Shore is Chicago based. Uh, The lab has been in business since 94. Um, Pre-pandemic, we've been doing everything that you would expect a diagnostic lab to do. So our clients are physicians practices, community hospitals, urgent care centers. Um, But being molecular, being high capacity, we had the people, processes, and technology from the onset of the pandemic to conduct PCR testing. So early in the pandemic, we were tapped by IDPH to start supporting the at-risk communities at that time. So that's nursing homes, assisted living facilities, uh, and senior living facilities. Uh, Essentially, our teams would come on site, we would collect specimens, return them to our lab, and result them. Right around Thanksgiving last fall, many schools started reaching out to us to uh, discuss how testing can be included in the return to class discussion. Um, what's largely largely changed from this coming fall to last spring is IDPH's test to stay uh, option. And um, previously in the spring when we would test at a district, if we identified a positive, they were more or less closed down that classroom. So all 40 or 50 kids in that classroom would essentially be quarantined at home and would be subjected to remote learning. Now IDPH is providing the option that uh, children in close contact to a known positive can test to stay. So essentially they remain in the classroom, but they would be tested on day one, day three, day five, and day seven. And subjected to negative PCR test results, uh, they would remain in the classroom. So the benefit of course is kids are staying in the classroom. Um, we conduct two types of COVID testing. It's um, PCR testing as well as rapid antigen testing. Uh, the premise of both is to identify if an individual is infected with COVID, but arguably they're two very different tests. 
Um, a rapid antigen test is uh, seeking to identify the presence of certain proteins associated with COVID-19. Um, the benefit of the test is it's a rapid, like its name, and the result can be yielded within 15 minutes. Uh, the caveat of the test, the downside of the test, is that it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's got issues with false negatives. So an individual would have to have a significantly high viral load for the test to be effective, uh, effectively useful. And uh, so if it does yield a positive, it's very likely that individual is positive because uh, false positives are few and far between with rapid antigen tests. However, false negatives can be an issue. So what that means is if an individual is infected but is carrying a low viral load, the antigens may not be detectable at that time. Um, so for that reason, we also provide a PCR test, which is a molecular test, which is um, designed to detect the presence of the virus's genetic material in an infected individual. So even trace amounts of genetic material can be identifiable with a PCR test. Now, the downside of a PCR test is that it's not a rapid. So and in practicality, if we were to collect a specimen in the morning, we would transport it back to our lab in Albany Park and it would result late afternoon, early evening. So there is a, a time frame um, around that. However, the accuracy is close to 100%. The specificity and sensitivity are in the upper 99 percentiles as well. So it's a very accurate test. Industry-wise, it's known as the gold standard. Um, uh, so that is a test that we, we are uh, implementing into many school districts right now. And we're also um, providing rapid antigen tests to school nurses because the effective use case for using rapids is if a uh, symptomatic student or faculty member were to walk into a school nurse, that's where you would want to run a rapid antigen test. You wouldn't necessarily want to run it on close contacts. You wouldn't necessarily want to run it as a screening tool uh, because of the false negative issue there. Um, and, and touching on Dr. Said's point uh, regarding immigration status and COVID vaccine or testing, um, much of what we do is subsidized through various federal programs. So um, if an individual has insurance, we can build their insurance. There's no copay or no out-of-pocket cost. Irregardless, there's no absolutely no cost to the district when it comes to COVID testing or COVID vaccines. Now, if an individual is uninsured or underinsured, we file for reimbursement um, with the state who is subsidizing COVID testing and vaccine administration through various federal programs, such as the CARES Act initially, which lapsed earlier this year. Now it's the Families First Act, and there's the America's Rescue Act as well. So there's a few different federal leg legislations which are subsidizing COVID testing for uninsured individuals as well as uh, COVID vaccine administration. None of these legislative tools uh, go uh, put any requirements on clinicians to check for immigration status for an individual. So that's not a question that we ask. Um, we do ask if an individual has ID, but to Dr. Said's point, um, if an individual does not, we are not going to not test them or not administer the vaccine uh, to them as well. Um, uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to pause right there, Dr. Rivera, and, um, just ask you if there's any other areas you would like for us to touch upon. You know, I, I know I did, uh, uh, at one point we spoke and, and you had mentioned, you know, referring to the ID Would that, like say if there's no social security number or, or something to that nature, would that be an issue for this or not? So it's clumped in with the ID. Concept. Yeah, that's that's directly tied into the ID. So um, ideally, from a reporting standpoint, the state, um, IDPH, Cook County Public Health, and other health departments need to track who is getting vaccinated, and they want to know who is getting tested, right? And the easiest way to do that is to correlate our efforts with a unique identifier. Most people have a social security number. Most people have a state-issued ID. So those are uh, those are two unique identifiers that we can use, but um, there are instances where neither are available, and in those instances, it's not going to stop us from doing the needful. In fact, we're guided to continue doing what we need to do, irregardless of having those. 
So we'd like to collect those just so we can provide improved reporting, but we don't want that to stop anyone from coming in to get tested or from coming in to get a vaccine. Very good. And then one, one important part that you had mentioned, but I want to emphasize a little bit is that, you know, the, the rapid antigen is a 15 minute, but I do want to say, I mean, and you, you kind of said it as if it's not rapid, but I think to get that PCR test, I want to emphasize that, you know, a lot of times you had explained and you even explained it here, but it, it, it kind of glazed over really quickly, but I want to emphasize because it is rapid. Um, you know, you it explained that you can get a test a lot of times, same day, evening yeah. Yeah. or the next day by noon. And and really, when you look at what it used to be, individuals were missing minimum three to five days to come back from a quarantine or to get results to know what's happening. Um, and, and, and I just think that's a, a very rapid turnaround, even though it's not 15 minutes. I, I think that's a big benefit to, to uh, working with North Shore. No, you've... Um... You, you really nailed it because uh, um, initially a year ago, this would be an entirely different conversation. At that time, even our entire industry was trying to understand the supply chain constraints around the materials we need, let alone, um, let, let alone the testing constraints that we had. Much of those things have been resolved. Our lab runs on three shifts, more or less close to 20 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. Um, and we, we've got a large team. So we've, we've built up to have the capability to be able to turn these results around. And when we look at schools, we, we, we view schools um, in the same category as we do nursing homes, that it, these are high priority categories. The last thing that we want to do is to send a child into school where we're sitting on their specimen and they're potentially positive, or let alone have a child quarantined at home when they should be in the classroom. So we strive every effort possible to get these specimens into our lab, analyzed and resulted as quickly and expeditiously as possible. And we do that through several strategies. One is um, we have many couriers that are circulating the area. So if your team were to collect a specimen, they can contact us and we'll arrange for a quick pickup. Um, secondarily, it's supplying your, your teams with a lot of the supplies that they would need for collecting the specimen. And thirdly, providing our teams on standby that if the number of students is high enough where well, that would be tedious or cumbersome for your nurses to swap, well then our team will come on site to do it, right? So uh, uh, putting these mitigation factors into place to help expedite testing provides us the ability to flip results back around either same day or definitely, definitely uh, the following morning. Excellent, excellent. And, and, and just practically, we have spoken about how this could work and function. <clears throat> and then some districts have done this. You know, you gave us some options where some districts have done it after school, um, during the day, and these different. And, and again, what I'm trying to protect is, is the school environment, all the individuals in the school, and then followed by the educa educational time of not only the student being able to be in school, as often as possible, but also for the teacher. So they're the ones providing, they're the experts providing the, the education. So it's it's safely trying to keep everyone in the building. So, um, you know, uh, kind of with that, could you talk about, you know, some possible options? Because we have not designated how we would implement this yet, but if yeah. you could just talk about that briefly. So, so the community gets an idea of how this may work. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we, we are currently servicing about, um, I want to say about 15 different school districts, about 40 individual schools, and uh, the city colleges of Chicago. So that's Malcolm X, Kennedy King, Dawson Technical, Harold Washington, Olive Harvey, so the entire network. Each engagement is different, right, because it's predicated upon the objective for that administration, that community, and those key stakeholders involved in shaping the testing strategy uh, for, for their for their communities. Um, so we view it as three different buckets, you can call it. There's asymptomatic testing, symptomatic testing, and quarantine testing, which is kind of the test, uh, test to stay, right? So let's take symptomatic testing. Symptomatic testing, more or less, our teams will not necessarily be on site because it could happen 
any day uh, during the week when a symptomatic child or faculty member would walk into uh, your nurse's office and say, I'm, I'm having flu-like symptoms, I am losing the ability to smell and possibly the ability to taste, right? So your student, uh, your school nurse, excuse me, would make the clinical discretion at her clinical discretion as to whether or not to administer a COVID test, right? And we're gonna, it's solely up to their discretion based on their medical experience, uh, expertise, and uh, uh, should they decide to uh, uh, run a PCR test or collect a PCR specimen. So in that scenario, if a specimen is collected, you would simply, the, the school would simply contact North Shore. We would come down, collect the specimen, and return it to our lab. Um, asymptomatic testing is more screening testing. And this is what most of the schools that we worked with in the spring are do, um, have done and what they're going to be doing in the fall. This is you take either the entire population or you take a subset of the population and you do weekly screening testing. And this could be either during the day or after school hours. We're flexible. It's more so dependent on what is the what is least disruptive for the student's schedule, right? And more or less, a uh, North Shore team would come on site. We would have all the information for this for the individuals in advance, so we'd know their names, their addresses, email addresses for reporting results in advance. So we would simply register them while they come on site, either into a school gymnasium or a classroom. And all we would need to collect from them is their name and date of birth. From there, they would move on to our testing station where our technicians would then uh, collect the specimen. So when they collect the specimen, it can be done with one of two options. One is a simple nasal swab. So this is simply inserting a swab, which is an extended Q-tip more or less, into each nostril for five to 10 seconds. And it's inserted roughly about half an inch into the nostril. So it's not painful and it's uh, rotated in a circular motion whereby it's rubbing against the nasal wall. So once the specimen is collected, the student moves on and the next student comes in. So we can implement a registration uh, whereby kids are allocated certain time slots, or if it's driven by uh, during the school day, we can go classroom to classroom to do something like this as well. So um, the third bucket is the quarantine, which is the test to stay, which is, based off of the first two buckets of asymptomatic and symptomatic testing, if we identify a positive, well, now we know that there's gonna be potentially some close contacts who, and if District 103 decides to do the test to stay option, those close contacts would need to be tested on day one, three, five, and seven in order for them to remain in the classroom. So a North Shore team member could come down to collect specimens from the close contacts or the school nurse can collect those specimens as well. And either our courier would come pick them up or our team member, if they're collecting the specimens, would return them to our lab in Albany Park. So uh, much of the engagements we do are variations of one of those three buckets. Uh, it's either the asymptomatic, nearly all of them were providing support for the symptomatic uh, so, uh, uh, support as well. Because the test to stay is something new, that's not something we've uh, executed on as yet, but we intend on doing that pretty widely this fall. Excellent, excellent. And then just to put one piece of the puzzle together is, is you know, North Shore uh, has been the uh, organization that has put in place our two vaccination clinics. Um, these have gone very well. Uh, we did do a survey recently and, and the the amount interested in vaccination was was pretty low, so you know we're just trying to to get some information out and and yeah. um, you know educate uh, our, our student staff community about about what we have going on here and and, and all this is in you know in, in the best interest of safety of, of everyone involved and, and trying to keep you know the education moving through this unique circumstance which last year we. We stayed out of the way, but this year we're going to be engaging, you know, more so in person. So I want to make sure, you know, we have every safety measure in place that that, that we have available to us. So yeah, no, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then talking about vaccines, we do do a lot of vaccine clinics at various schools, companies, and even community clinics. And I can tell you this: if everyone's goal, if, if school board, superintendent, faculty, parents, families, everyone's goal is to keep schools open. 
as Dr. Syed said, that's, that's one critical component, right? That along with the behavior controls that the district's putting into place with the layered mitigation based on the community positivity rates, masking, social distancing, limiting certain activities, um, that is all crucial, right? Testing is not gonna prevent COVID from coming into your schools. The benefit of testing is to identify one who may have COVID, isolate them and remove them uh, prior to any mass exposure, right? But I, I can't discount uh, at all the importance of vaccines and most importantly, some of the behavior controls that the district's putting into place as well. In conjunction, I think all three of these talking points make for important considerations for just uh, uh, not only returning to the classroom, but more importantly, keeping classrooms open. And I was very pleasantly surprised with, um, with IDPH's um, endorsement of the test to stay option. Um, there were many schools that we were working with this spring where we identified a positive and an entire classroom had to shut down for significant periods of time. And uh, I, I spoke with many administrators uh, for these schools and, and they showed me data that it was demonstrable with extended periods of remote uh, learning for some of these kids that it had an adverse impact on their learning in general. So having this ability to keep classrooms open uh, with the test to stay option is, uh, I believe, is a win for all the key stakeholders involved. Absolutely. I, I, I don't know if we want to field any questions or, or if you have any other talking points. Um, so I think we hit most of the broad talking points that um, Dr. Said and I wanted to cover. Um, more so, I, I wanted Dr. Said to share um, what he's seeing at the hospital, right? And I wanted to share what we're seeing in the lab. So being a high capacity lab, we're doing a lot of COVID testing. And we're, we are definitely seeing more positives now than we were seeing last month. Um, yeah, and I, I absolutely agree to that because even in the hospital, uh, just in our hospital and the area hospitals, we're seeing a rise in the numbers of COVID admissions. And we're also seeing, you know, uh, the COVID testing numbers starting to go up a lot more and uh, the positive rates. I can even tell you uh, just within even our hospital, uh, we've even got staff members that have tested positive that we've had to uh, quarantine. So, I mean, this just all kind of leads into that, you know, as we're following the charts, uh, we're seeing a steady rise. Um, it's kind of very important for all of us to really, uh, and again, you know, I think that I would defer to the Department of Public Health, but, um, you know, really pushing forward with social distancing, wearing the mask, probably reducing down, you know, uh, 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 some of the things that we do in public, like restaurants and things like that, down to a lower number. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, remember when we talked about flattening the curve, we're probably going to have to take measures like that. Yeah, and I can say specifically for, for our district, we, we observed four, um, four zip codes regularly last year, and I looked at them this morning, and about three weeks ago, it was at, at around 1%, 1.5 across those four. Now we're up near 5% right now, a little bit above five. Um, Brookfield is still rather low at about 2.4 something, but um, yeah, that, that, that's a significant increase in a short period of time. And, and that data that you're seeing, we're, that data is all coming from labs like us, right? So we are reporting all of our results to IDPH and they're getting the number of tests that we do and the number of positives. Similarly, it's all the regional labs that are providing that data. So um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's across the board. Um, we, I'm, we're probably seeing a 5X jump in the, in the positive right now from last month. And that coincides directly with the positivity rate in Chicago, as well as the uh, Collar counties as well. Uh, happy to open it up for some questions. Yeah, and we, we were going to do uh, the chat. You can either do the chat, but it's such a small group. If, if you want to just unmute yourself and ask a question, feel free. And uh, we'll, we'll exercise a little wait time here and see if anyone wants to type in or unmute. Hi, 
Hi, uh, Mr. Rivera, this is Mary Beth Conti, Lincoln kindergarten teacher. Um, my question is for the children to be tested, it, you know, whatever um, you implement, do we need parent permission to do so? Good question. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, we absolutely do. So, and I, I wanna touch upon that on both testing and vaccine. So for testing, um, we would require any minor who is going to be uh, receiving a COVID test to uh, have a, com uh, a completed minor consent form. Uh, so their their guardian would execute, would complete this on their behalf and provide it to the district. We would have that on file as well. Um, for the vaccine, um, we go a little bit further in that we would want the guardian present, uh, the parent legal guardian present if a minor is going to be receiving the vaccine. Um, and we're, we're uh, mindful that in certain situations, um, a parent may not be present, um, but even in, that, even in that circumstance, they can send somebody else who is not a minor, an adult, to accompany the child, but we would have the guardian uh, complete certain paperwork that they approve of that alternative adult being there to accompany the child. And that's only for the vaccine, not for testing. And, and, and to reiterate again, we're, you know, we're looking at rolling this out on a, on a volunteer basis, um, not as any mandatory um, requirement. Um, but, you know, part of the, the hope is that educating individuals, you know, through a presentation like this might make them more likely to participate in the, the testing and or uh, uh, vaccination uh, uh, clinics if we do those in the future, which you know, uh, North Shore has been very, very accommodating and saying, hey, if the need arises, we'll do one right away. So that, that, that's kind of the hope, but, but excellent question. And, and on, that, on that topic as well, so the minor consent form includes language in it, um, whereby we would uh, share the results with the district as well. So in order for us to be HIPAA compliant, uh, that language is incorporated in the minor consent form as well on that. Any other questions? Hearing none, I'm going to stop the recording.